so happy to be here again <clears throat> to speak to each and every one of you. I'm just grateful to the Lord that he gives me opportunity to minister for him. <clears throat> Father, I just pray now for your divine anointing to come upon me, Lord, and that which you've laid on my heart, let it come out very clearly. Thank you, Jesus, in thy name I pray, amen. Now, last time when we spoke, we spoke about the privilege of being chosen by God. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about one of the purposes of being chosen by God. Our text was found in Acts chapter 22, verse 14. I'm not going to read all of it, only what pertains to today's message. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee that thou shouldst know his will. So we're going to talk about being chosen to know his will. All right. Um, you know, it's not just knowing about the will of God in our head, all right? But I'm thinking of the word in Chinese, and it's ming bai. That means to clearly understand, clearly understand, uh, where the Lord reveals it clearly, not just to our head, but in our very spirits, all right? Why the Lord has chosen us. Um, I want us to go over here to... 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before <clears throat> the world began. <clears throat> So we see here that the Lord not only saved us, but he called us, and it's a holy calling, all right? So it, it says it's according to his own purpose and grace. This means he had a purpose, all right? Uh, he not only had a purpose when he created us, but when he called us, he had a reason why he called us. And actually, he wants to have close fellowship with us. That's his purpose for calling us, all right? And he said it isn't according, you know, how often we think, am I good enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I done this enough? Have I done that enough? It has nothing to do with our works, all right? But it says it's according to his grace. It's his ability. It's his life. It's his Power. Amen. So it's very important that we see this next portion because it tells us that our God is a holy God. First Peter chapter one, verse 14 to 16. As obedient children. So you can see here, you know, God is not only holy, he's our God. And he's a holy God. But according to this verse, he is our father. Amen. We're his children. Amen. What a marvelous thing that God has done. <clears throat> that the supreme creator, I have, in the name of Jesus, I come against you, Satan. In Jesus' name, I plead the blood. And you take your hands off of my vocal cords. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. What love he showed to us when he chose us, not just as sinners and not just that he made us, you know, not to be sinners, but he made us his very own children that he actually brought us into his very family. What great love that was. Hallelujah. So he says here, as obedient children, please notice that, all right? We don't become his children and then do whatever we want to do, but we need to obey him as our heavenly father. It says, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts, 
in your ignorance. You see, before we came to the Lord, we were ignorant of God. We didn't know his ways. We just did whatever we felt like doing and what everybody else was doing, all right? And what we don't realize is this word fashioning, our words, our lifestyle, our actions, our deeds is actually fashioning us. You see people that do very cruel things, their face becomes hard, very hard. You see people that are loving and kind, their face has a soft look to it. So our actions, our words, our lifestyle literally fashions us and makes us show what we are, all right? I have seen people that after they came to the Lord later, they go back to their own ways and, and their whole face changes. They're, they, they just change. Our lifestyle definitely fashions. So it says, don't fashion yourself according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. Don't try to act holy. I tell you, when people see us putting on a front, trying to act holy and sanctimonious, it's quite disgusting. God says, be ye holy. That's from within our very spirits. We're to be like him. It says, in all manner of conversation. This word conversation is an uh, old time word it doesn't mean necessarily our talk it's our lifestyle so in every part of our being he's saying we need to be holy why because it is written be ye holy for i am holy he says as your heavenly father i'm holy if you're going to be my children you also need to be holy you know, I remember many, many years ago when we first came to Singapore and we first started uh, Bethel Assembly of God. There was a young man in the church. He brought his friend. They were both uh, British servicemen and he brought his friend to the church. This British serviceman knew nothing about God. Uh, his family were not Christians, he didn't even have a, a Bible. And anyways, he came, he accepted the Lord, he even was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm just not the type to dig into your life. Uh, so after leading him to the Lord, he was baptized in the Lord, I just made sure that he did have a Bible. He didn't, so we made sure that he had a Bible and, you know, told him he needs to come to the services. He is the one that witnessed this and testified this to me. We didn't know that he had a mistress already, all right? And he would regularly go visit this mistress <clears throat> rather than just go, you know, to uh, prostitutes. He paid this lady, paid for the rent, and she became like his personal mistress. Well, after he had been saved, now, you know, I won't say God is going to do this for somebody else that knows the Bible, that knows what the Word of God says, but he did not know anything. And because I never asked into his life, you know, what sins did you have? I, I left that to God. So we didn't know about this. But one day after he's born again and after he has been baptized in the Spirit, he felt, I want to go visit this lady. So he went there. He went into the room, and uh, his back, uh, her back rather, was next, standing next to the bed. And he put his arms around her, and he began to, like, start to make love to her. And this is what he told me. He said, suddenly, the Holy Spirit that had filled him said to him, you can't do this anymore. You belong to me. He said, I got the shock of my life. He said, it, it happened so fast, my arms are around her. And he said, I just, and I just gave her a push. She fell over backwards on the bed. And 
he said, I turned around and I ran out of there as fast as I could go. Now, you know, when we already know the word, God isn't going to come and say, you shouldn't do that. You know, he expects you to read the word and know those things. But this young man knew nothing. And the Holy Spirit came on the scene right then and there and stopped him from going further and let him know, you belong to me. You can't do this anymore. All right. Because our God is a holy God. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 tells us without holiness, shall no man see the Lord, all right? Um, God's will is for you and me to be holy. Let's go there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, all right? Uh, it's, I'm going to do verse 3 and then verse 7, all right? For this is, now this portion of scripture just tells us very clearly what the will of God is. It starts out and says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, all right? Now, what is sanctification? It means being taken, set apart from sin. That's what the Lord does to us when we're born again. He takes us out of sin. We're set apart from sin, but he sets us apart unto himself to be holy. All right. That's what sanctification is. And it says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, friends, abstain means stay away from it. Totally stay away from it. You don't even do it one time. And this word fornication in the original is pornea, all right? And it includes all kind of immorality. Homosexuality, lesbianism, incest, pornography, you name it. It's included in this one word, fornication, all right? And he said, you should abstain, stay away from it. Go down to verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. All right. God did not call you out of sin for you to continue on in this type of sin. So it says, this is the will of God. Uh, my second point for this, not only that God is holy, but God's temple is holy, all right? This is found in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20, all right? Uh, verse 18 says, flee fornication. Up there it said abstain. Don't do it. But here it says run from it. Run from it. Get as far away from it as you can, all right? Um. Because every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sins against his own body. And almost as if Paul is thinking, people are saying, how is that? How is that? He says, verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You see, what is a temple for? A temple is where you worship God, a place of worship. So he's saying your body is a place of worship. Your body is what is housing the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. That means God gave us his blessed Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right. Both of these, body and spirit, belong to God. Don't just think it's my spirit. My spirit is saved. What I do with my body, never mind. Um, this really doesn't have to do with fornication, but this has to do the, with piercing. Piercing the body is a... And this is not by a Christian. This is just by, I, I read it somewhere or saw it on a thing. 
what it is stating is, my body is my own. I will do what I want with it. No, you and I as children of God, friends, our body is not our own. Not only is our spirit born again, but he has put his Holy Spirit in us and our body and our spirit belong to the Lord. All right? Now, God has provided for our safety. I want us to go here and look in Isaiah 35, 8 to 10. <clears throat> you see, God's ways always bring safety into our life. I'm reminded of the children of Israel when God brought them out of Egypt, and then they were 40 years in the wilderness wandering around. Well, you know, there was no food, there was no water in the wilderness, but, um, and there in the, God provided both for them, all right, food and water. But there were a lot of poisonous vipers, poisonous snakes in, in that wilderness. As long as they walked with God, doing the will of God, obeying God, they were not bitten at all. But when they started to disobey God, suddenly that protection was not there, and those serpents came out and bit them, and many people died, all right? So God has always his way of doing things, and this is why he tells us to be obedient to him because his way is always higher than our ways and his way is a way of safety. Let's look here in Isaiah 35. It says, and highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called a way of holiness, all right? Uh, the unclean shall not pass over it but it's going to be for those, the wayfaring man. No lion is going to be there. No ravenous beast. This is definitely referring to satanic powers and satanic spirits. Because the Bible says the devil as a roaring lion is seeking whom he may devour. And the Lord in these verses is telling us, I have prepared this highway of holiness, if you stay on that, the devil can't get up there, the devil can't attack you, all right? And no other ravenous beast can hurt you up there. Only the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord are going to come with songs and everlasting joy on their heads. They're going to obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You know, so often we see God's ways, his rules, his commandments. Uh, we kind of see them as hampering us. You know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. There's a lot of do this, do this. But we always focus on don't do this and don't do that. But I want you to know they are there to help us, to keep us in safety. I remember when we first came to Singapore in 1955, and uh, the place that we stayed, all right, we were given one room because the, the other missionary, he had the other bedroom. So we were given this one bedroom. And when I walked in it, oh, I'd never seen a house like that. You know, I mean, I came from America, and you don't, have, and even in China, they didn't have these. These were iron bars. I think they went this way, or horizontally on the window. And I said to my husband, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm in a prison. This is our bedroom, but I feel like I'm in a prison, iron bars. But you know, one morning when I woke up, my husband used to keep his pants on the chair here the window was on this side of the room. And when I, I always woke up before he did, when I got up, his pants weren't where he usually hangs them over the chair. His pants were under the window. And I s woke him up and I said, Dad, why would you take your pants off under the window? He said, I didn't. I put them on the chair. Oh, light began to dawn. Somebody with a wooden not wooden, but a bamboo pole, 
had come and put through those bars. We kept the windows open, the shutters, all right, but it had the bars. And they hooked his pants, brought them over, went through the pockets, stole all his money, dropped the pants there under the window because they didn't need the pants. I tell you, I saw those bars in a different way. From that day on, I love those bars. Those bars didn't speak of prison to me. They spoke of safety. Had they not been there, that man would have come into our bedroom, not just put a pole through it. So it is with the God's ways. Therefore, our safety, all right? Let's go back to that first verse we started with, 2 Timothy 1, 9, who has saved us and called us, all right? according to his purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world even began. So we can see here, this is my second point, all right? God's will centers around Jesus in everything. 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to do 4, 5, and 9. Uh, he says, I thank my God on your behalf for the grace of God, his life, his power, his ability, which is given you by Jesus Christ. So you see, this grace that he wants to enable us with is found in Jesus. In fact, it says he is full of the grace of God. Uh, it says in verse 5, in everything you're enriched by him whether it's to give out, whether it's to take in, in everything, he, we are enriched by Jesus, all right? Whatever we need, when, if we need to speak something, he gives it to us. I remember this one time that um, there was a lady in our church, a young lady, all right? She felt God had called her into the ministry. She wanted to go to the Bible school. Her father was a traveling salesman, and uh, the mother, she, she was Indian, but she was a Christian from another uh, church, and she did not want her to go because she was the sole uh, breadwinner, so to speak. She was a, like a music teacher, and she didn't want her to go for that reason. So the husband wasn't there to back her up, so she got her son-in-law. And uh, they all came to the house as if we had called her. We never called her. She felt called of the Lord. We were just going to drive her up there. And uh, they were trying to stop her and say, no, why she shouldn't go. And this uh, son-in-law was the spokesman. He was a good speaker. And I tell you, he had every reason going on and on and on. It didn't bother me because... I knew that we had nothing to do with it. If they didn't want her to go, that's their affair. If they want her to go, that, that's fine also. But I was crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And God said, ask him this question. I don't remember what the question was, and it was sounded like a silly question to me. It didn't even make sense. It didn't have anything to do with what we were talking about there. And uh, so... I made sure I let him know. I stopped and I said, God is telling me to ask you this question. Because I thought, if I don't, he'll think I'm nutty uh, bringing up something like this. And when I repeated what God told me to ask him, it made no sense to me at all. He, he just looked at me. His eyes kind of got like he was taken aback. That's the only way I can say. And then he just stopped talking. Her mother then, you know, so what do you think? What do you think? She was trying to get him to go on. And he said, I think she should go to Bible school. I have no idea what that question meant, but she went to Bible school. So God knew what it meant, and he gave me the utterance, all right? The same thing with when we don't understand what we don't know. He's able to give it to us, all right? Verse 9, God is faithful who has called us unto the fellowship. So you see, friends, we have been called to have a share in the life of Christ, all right? We're called to have a part in his purpose and in his plans. 
The last thing under that is that we are complete in him. All right. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, it says all wisdom and knowledge is in Christ. All right. All wisdom and knowledge. So it starts here with verse 8 and says, beware, be careful, lest anybody through philosophy, all right, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiment of the world and not after Christ. Beware lest they spoil you, all right? <clears throat> and I just wrote on my paper, all right, that, um, you know, sometimes uh, new age, new age meditation, all right, um, yoga, exercising, it all sounds so good. I tell you, friends, we don't need anything out there. You start going there, you will be robbed of all that you have. Everything, whatever it is, the wisdom, the way to do things, all knowledge is found in Jesus, and it says we are complete in him. If you lack something, if you don't know what to do, go to him. He has the answer. I've told you this before, but it comes to me right now, all right? Um, this lady, that friend of mine, she was a nurse, all right? And she was studying to be an administrative nurse. She had already been uh, like a local nurse and doing but she wanted this other and one day in the university her prof, the professor gave them pages and pages of true and false questions and said that you study for this exam you study all these pages and then you know I will take the questions from all these pages how to memorize all of that so she went to the lord lord how am i going to study for this i can't memorize pages and pages and pages like this and the lord just said to her you pick out all the questions that are false there's not that many memorize those so if your question isn't false then you know it has to be true she got 100 percent on her exam the others all wondered, how did you do it? Who told you? I tell you, friends, we're complete in him. He has an answer for everything. It says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus, the Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It isn't just Jesus himself. Anything to do with God the Father, anything to do with God the Son, all right? That means what he was before he even came. Anything to do with God the Spirit. The fullness is in Jesus, all right? And you are complete. My last point is Jesus is to be preeminent, all right? That's Colossians chapter 1. 15 to 18. That means he is to be first in everything. It says, Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. See, we can't see God. He's a spirit. But Jesus is God, the son who came down and became a human being. And he is the very image. We call it the splitting image, all right, of his father. You don't have to see the father. Uh, when they said, show us the father, it will suffice us. And he says, have I been so long with you, Philip? Don't you know me yet? What we see in Jesus, that is what God the father is like. So go to the Bible, study the Bible, whatever Jesus was like, God the father is just like that, all right? It says here, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Firstborn doesn't mean he was the first one born. One of the false uh, religions, all right, tries to say that, that he was the first create. No, no, no. This is a title, and it comes from a word that means foremost in time, place, order, or um, can't importance. All right, so he's the firstborn of every creature. This is talking about the first creation. That means all of us now, before we even come to the Lord, all right? But we're told that he's also come down to verse 
uh, 17. He is before all things. By him all things uh, consist, all right? Everything was created by him. Everything was created for him. Everything you see around you, he is sustaining it. He is upholding it. It says he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So he is not only the firstborn of the first creation because he created it, because it's all created for him, my friends, but he is the firstborn of all of us that have been born again. That means we've been called out of sin and later we will be resurrected when we die. He's the firstborn. He's to be the top, the head, that he might have the preeminence. That means in rank and in uh, influence. Yeah. When I put my glasses on, I can't see you all. If I don't have it on, I can't read my words I'm just going to tell you this story, and I know you've heard it before, but I'm, I'm going to tell you anyways. When I first came to Singapore, uh, and then I'd been here some time, uh, I started having hobbies, you know, collect stamps, collect coins. I won't go into the whole background, but each time I chose a hobby, God would come and say, no, no. No, no, you can't. And I listened to him. But after I tried, I didn't do it immediately. I'd not have a hobby and then find out, I, I need a hobby. Get a different hobby, you know. After the fourth time when he said, no, no, I, got, I don't know about you. I'm just telling you my own story. I got mad at God. And I, I didn't just get mad. He sees it anyway. So I talked to him. And I just said, God, do you have a problem with hobbies. You know, if you do, I'm going to be a tattletale. Sister so-and-so, she was an elderly missionary that taught in our Bible school. Uh, we had a Bible school then. And I, I said, she has five. I know because she showed them to me, this hobby, that, uh, and she has them all simultaneously. If you don't like hobbies, you go over to her and knock on her door and tell her not to have hobbies. Don't come and tell me I only have one, and then you tell me, no, no. You know, God didn't get angry with me. You know why? Because he knew that I was ignorant, that all I was doing is seeing it through my natural eyes. He said, she has five hobbies. I'm number one in her life. You have one hobby, and I've lost my place. I'm not number one. For you, you cannot have hobbies. For her, she can have hobbies. Friends, he must be number one. He must have the preeminence in us, in everything. All right? Romans 8, 28 and 29. We know that so well where it says, all things work together for good to them who love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. You see, God can take anything and everything and use it in our lives because it says, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate, predetermine that we should be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. All right, friends, he wants us to be conformed to the image. He wants us to be changed to be like him. All right, and he wants to form Christ in us. In Galatians 4.19, Paul says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. See, right now, most of us, unless you've been a Christian a long time, we still have our own personality, our ways, the things we like. But he's changing us from glory to glory to become more like him so that it's Christ. Won't Christ won't be like a baby in us, but Christ will start to mature. His life will be allowed to mature in us, all right? Paul also says Christ is to be preached 
through our lives. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. You see, our lives are to speak of Jesus. When people see us, are they seeing us or are they seeing Jesus shining through us? All right. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. This is my last verse. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. You and I are nothing but a clay pot. Throw the pot down, it can crack and break open. There's no power in it. There's nothing in it. But we have in this clay pot of treasure. That treasure is Jesus Christ. It says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. My friend, let me tell you, we can't do anything but Jesus in us as we walk in obedience to him, as we keep him first in our life, as we keep our eyes upon him, he will flow through us. His life will flow out of us. People will see it and they will want what you and I have. They will want the joy that we have. They will want the peace that they see in us. They will want the power that they see in us. Do you remember uh, Peter and them, all right, when, when they baptized, you know, prayed over those to be filled with the Spirit? And then many mighty miracles were done. I think Philip was the one that went there first. And then people came up to pray for them to be filled with the Spirit. And there was this sorcerer that had accepted the Lord, quote, unquote. But he, he missed the power that he had. So when he saw the power through them, praying and miracles took place. He said, I want this. I'm willing to give money for it. Friends, the gifts of God don't come with money. But when people see it, they recognize that's not humanly possible. Then they realize it's a greater power and it turns them to the Lord. All right, friends, his will is that our life should be set apart from sin, set apart to him, no longer to please ourselves, but to please him alone. And friends, we can't do this ourselves. All right, we're born again through Christ. We've been put into Jesus Christ, but we need to abide in him. We need to draw from him. We need to depend upon him. We need to give him first place and let him be the Lord of our life, all right? Let him have first place. Let him sit on the throne of our life. Let him lead us and direct us in our life. And then let him have all the glory and the honor. Shall we bow our heads? Shall we bow our heads right now? We might know his will. His will is in a life of holiness. And only Jesus can give us that power, that ability, that strength to deny ourselves and to do things for God and in God's way. If those watching right now, if you have a need, my friend, if you realize there's things in your life that he said, abstain, stay away from it, and you say, but I, I just can't cry out to Jesus right now. I'm going to say a word of prayer for each and every one that perhaps right now, you're wanting to raise your hand and say, I need help. I want to know the Lord. I want to walk this walk of holiness. I want Jesus to have preeminence in my life. Father, right now, you see each and every person's heart. You see the hunger. You see the desire. You see the longing to be everything that you want us to be. I pray right now, Lord, that while people are just crying out to you from their heart, your Holy Spirit is going to touch them. Lord, you're going to give them that assurance that they belong to you, and you're going to put within them that 
strong, not only desire, but a purposing in their heart that they are going to purpose in their heart to be what you want them to be. In Jesus' precious name, amen.